Hey, hello, it's the Bird Emergency, Grant Williams. I'm a bird nerd. There, actually, let's let's have a bit of fun with this. Ooh. Right there, that's Holly Parsons, Dr. Holly Parsons. Holly, where are you from? So I am in Darawal country, Wollongong. Darling in today, and it's a bit of that autumn chill, but nice bit of sunshine. Thankfully, no rain today. The ground is still very soggy. I saw that we are going to get above average rainfall in the for most of Australia over the next six months, I think was the projection. Up some places up to eighty percent above average rainfall. It was only the southwest of Western Australia that was going to miss out. Now, oh look, we've got a comment. We've already got a comment. Help him. <laughs> I don't know what you were talking about. You might tell us, you might fill us in on that one because I reckon I say a lot of stuff that people can disagree with <laughs> and I'm sure there'll be a bit of it in my in my um, top 12 pr- plant selections today because that's why we're here, Holly. Uh, we're going to try and go through some of the issues that you have to confront when trying to plant a friendly garden for your neighbourhood birds and animals. Uh, I'm going to give you some suggestions so that you don't have to be led led by the by the nurseryman <laughs> so much that you can go there with a with, with a list in mind. And I'm actually going to give you a an idea of how to how to systematically shop when you go to the nursery. I might add, Holly, I've worked in nurseries a lot. <laughs> I'm a horticulturist. I don't know if people get that apart from being sweary and ranty on twitter and thanks kim yeah it's very disheartening that we're in an election campaign and people are latching on to climate change but we're not hearing anything about biodiversity which is making me really angry and i can't contain my rage sometimes when people just are ignoring it so holly i think let's start because it's such a big topic Let's start with some of the things that you have a concern about when we're go when we're talking about plants for birds. Let's make it a general topic because there are some issues that can be dealt with, but let's get them up front and center. All right, we're going to start with complaints. Excellent. Well, All right. Well, I don't know. I, I don't know if I'd put them in the complaints basket, but I think they're the things that you really need to consider because sometimes. Oh, look, I know I was guilty. I've been guilty of this when I worked in nurseries that were not my own nursery. And a truck will arrive on Thursday afternoon with a whole lot of stuff that the boss has bought on special. And there'll be a whole lot of stuff in there that it's your job on the weekend to sell. Mm-hmm. But stacks of it's got weed potential, for instance. Now, I hate I hated selling it, but it's one of the compromises you make. I would never do that anymore, but I recognise that some people have to make compromises. And because we're a participatory show here, Kim writes a regular column on wildlife friendly gardens. So this is great. I'm real. I'll be expecting you to be popping all sorts of suggestions in, Kim, as we go through. Feel free to disagree with me because I'm coming at this from a Melbourne temperate zone perspective. We did get some fantastic contributions, which we will also go through, from all over the country. But, Holly, let's start with compliance while I get my I get those lists up. Okay, sure. I guess like you alluded to, Grant, there's the potential when you go down to buy some plants, that the plants that you are buying at a big nursery are not necessarily going to be the best options for your particular garden. So it might not be great for the climatic conditions. There could be issues around their potential to be weeds. And there are a whole range of nursery plants, which we know can go rogue and end up in bushland. From a bird perspective, I guess one of the biggest challenges I find is that so many of the plants that are labelled as bird-friendly, that at the big nurseries are bird friendly, but they're not necessarily attracting the birds that need help. 
so we tend to have this sort of oversupply of big, showy, nectar-producing plants like your bottle brushes and your big hypergravillias that look absolutely beautiful in the garden and that's certainly a part of why we want to create a garden because we want to enjoy it as well, but that attract the big, bossy birds. And so when we're looking at the value of gardens and the urban environment for birds or wildlife as a whole, we want to be creating a balance. And certainly a lot of these plants tend to tip the balance. Uh, a lot of the plants tend to tip the balance in the favour of things like noisy miners, which are incredibly aggressive honey eater species. Along the East Coast, they will actively exclude um, other birds from their big territories. And that's usually smaller birds. Or things like rainbow lorikeets. Likewise, the most, probably the most common urban bird in Australia, I would think. And certainly coming out from our surveys tends to be very noisy, very aggressive, will outcompete some of the other smaller parrots for hollows as well. When you go to the shops and you're guided by a label that says bird friendly, it, it's a bit misleading because there's a huge range of great native plants out there that maybe are not going to be providing all the nectar, but can be providing great shelter or really uh, amazing insect life, which is critical for a garden as well. So. I guess I'd like to see that bird-friendly label widen to really showcase the huge range of native plants that can provide really great resources. for. Let's, let's provide some guidelines, Holly, for, okay. for how people can approach it. And I think this will be something that we'll come back to time and time again this year, I think, because... I don't, want to be, I don't want to be on a hobby horse about politics so much, but it's a time to take stock. When you're having when elections rock around, we've got we're going to be in another th- a three year cycle, and we're going to be locked in once once it's done, and then the changes that will be made personally, are things that we can do. So if we want to redo our garden, we can make the decisions about the three, five, ten year plan, putting in putting in our our preferred plants, thinking about colours, thinking about how it ties in with what else is in the neighbourhood and thinking about linking up to other neighbours that have got big trees or maybe got lots of dense trees because birds need a variety of of plants and habitat, habit, spaces, I like to call them. So, Holly, how I've broken this down <laughs> is into sections and I've picked a couple of plants that I think are good for each section. And I'm going to start with a canopy, with a tree, with a big tree. Now, not everybody can put a big tree in their garden, but if you live on the quarter acre block, the standard Australian housing block, you've got room for at least one and you need to think carefully about where you site it. And this is where species selection comes in handy. Some eucalypts are prone to shedding boughs in not only in storms, but also if you've had a really hot day and you suddenly get a cool change. The way eucalypts physiology are, they are designed to detach their branches. So do not plant them, do not plant a big tree over your carport, your house your gazebo or your neighbour's carport or your neighbour's house if something is going to reach over. But my first suggestion for a big tree would not be a eucalypt. It would be an acacia. And even though acacias live shorter lives, you will get a bigger tree quicker if you plant most acacias. And I would go, my suggestions would be a silver wattle, a black wattle or the blackwood. So you're looking at what have we got? Acacia dilbata, acacia mernsii, or acacia melanoxalan, I think, for the blackwood. So for my part of the world, and they would all be suitable in your part of the world, Holly, Sydney yep. as well, right through Victoria, New South Wales, Tasmania, Southeast South Australia, they would be my first selection. But there's a downside. And that is for the silver wattle and the black wattle for Mernsey Eye and Dilbata. So Dilbata is, I think I've got the right one. 
they shed a lot of leaves and they can be quite messy, but that's good. That's good if you are not obsessing over sweeping your path or whatever. Actually, let's get that out of the out, right out of the way. If you're obsessing about tidy paths and stuff like that, piss off. This isn't. It's not the show for you. You are not going to even be considering that. You're going to be out there with your leaf blower at seven thirty on a bloody Sunday morning, and you're going to be the kind of idiot who hoses down your driveway when we've got water restrictions on. So let's just get that out there. Piss off, okay? Otherwise. Nice to have you here. Oh, look, I, I will jump in, Grant, just quickly, just so we don't lose a whole heap of people. Well, we, didn't, um, and- we didn't lose anyone and we got a thumbs up. Look, I, I think I absolutely agree. Like leaf blowing and things in most cases is not at all necessary in a little block, but there can be a way to strike a balance between a bird-friendly garden and a tidier or neater-looking garden. Yeah, and but you do that. That's my point. Don't yeah. obsess about it, you know. Yeah, you can um, do that through pruning and yeah, shaping yeah, plants yeah, and creating. A, and you don't have to have a bush plant, a bush garden. Plant selection is what mm-hmm. it is. What it comes down to. If you're someone who's going to worry about leaves, please don't have a potosterum in your garden. I just that's just total hypocrisy. Not that I've got anything about, against potosterums, the New Zealand ones or the Australian ones, it's, but just be real. And every time you get too many leaves dropping off, that just means you've got better compost. And Very you've got true. A better mulch somewhere else in the garden. So, so did you like those? Yep. I did. And exactly, the silver wattle was going to be my first suggestion, too. So, yeah, look, eucalypts are what we quintessentially think of as the Australian tree. But wattles in a garden are fantastic because they grow so quick. So, you can get a bit of bang for your buck early on. It can be really frustrating to put some plants in the ground and you put them in as a little, tiny little tube stock and then you've got to kind of wait. Acacias are certainly going to get that canopy established quicker. And as you said, the downside is that they do have a shorter life cycle, but you can factor in for that. So while those are growing, you can have some other things planted that are going to take over once the acacias have had their day. And they're, they're also great for the soil. They're not nitrogen fixers, so they're going to be helping everything else that is to come to establish. That's right. And apart from the blackwood, both the silver and the black wattle sort of succession plants. So they're the plants that first to come back after a bushfire or if there's been a one of those windstorm events that knocks down trees, they're like a colonizer because of those reasons. They shelter the smaller plants quickly that come up. So they're useful to have in in your neighborhood. Mm-hmm. But I am going to suggest that uh, if you can find room for a large eucalypt, I think that's a good idea, but be very careful with what you select. Do not put in a Tasmanian blue gum, a eucalyptus globulus or something like that on a small house block because they are forest giants. Mm-hmm. They do not belong, but you can put in a large eucalypt. I'm going to suggest the one of the ironbarks, Eucalyptus cideroxalin. Usually you can get really good shapes from those nowadays. So you're going to probably get a really nice tree. You're going to get a, an interesting tree. And depending on which variety you get, you're going to get pink, yellow, or white. And the pink can be up to scarlet flowers. They're going to give you nice bark, but they're also got quite a dense canopy rather than an open canopy. So you can get a lot of kinds of birds in on them and if you didn't want to go for for that something like eucalyptus nicolai which is the willow i think the the willow leaf peppermint i think is sort of the common name it's a smaller smaller big tree denser canopy but again both of those two are not branch shedders in the way that all of the white gums the vimus the the spotted gums, the lemon scented, so all those kind of things, branch shedders notoriously. So you minimise the risk. They're my suggestions for big trees, Holly. What do you think of those? Two? Yeah, absolutely. Eucalypts are that sort of staple. That They're providing the great canopy. They're so useful from a perspective of the flowers, which are great for nectar. They are a hive of insect activity. They, of course, are where you get lerps. 
psyllids on the leaves that are lerps are just so critical for partalotes and small honey eaters and a whole range of little insect eaters as well. If you've got the space for eucalypts, they're certainly fantastic to have. And then, of course, you get down the tr- down the track future planning for hollows, but it needs to be in the right spot. Yeah. And that's where it gets really tricky. And if you don't have the right spot for it, that's okay. Don't for- don't try and force it just to try and get a eucalypt in the ground. Well, Grant, what do you think about some of the like going for dwarf variety or some of the various horticulture specimens that are around well, now. Well, let's, stru- let's structure how we, how we do this. I'll go, okay. through, I'll go through these couple more sections. Yep. Then we'll go and look at what the suggestions were on the yep. survey and talk about those, and we'll cover these kind of issues here. Because okay. in a way, I'm going to answer that question with the next thing, medium and s- medium small tree would be my next category. So we've got upper canopy, then we're moving into sort of maybe the five, four or five metre kind of size tree. And here I've got one standout, Eucalyptus leucoxalan, if you can find it, which is the pink flowering gum. You will see it in nurseries as Gulwa gem. If you can find that, it's a really great one to get hold of it's got a really nice shape it's reliable and it's quite quick to flower so maybe in your third year you'll get a good lot of flowers rather than having to wait nine or ten years like you might for some others and then my other suggestion in the small tree will be a banksia now this is going to be dependent on your area melbourne and sydney banksia serrata if you can if you can accommodate quite a large I call it a small tree because it takes so long to get really big but that's another one where you can look around the different cultivars and there are small varieties of Banksia serrata and that is what I would recommend will give you fantastic canopy and shade so they're really good for where you might want to site your compost bin or a utility area at the edge of the canopy of that plant be something you'll be able to work under like you can and not get but it will drop will drop a lot of leaves over the years but you will get fantastic cones you'll be able to bring them inside you can cut flowers and for flower arranging all that kind of stuff but i think that's i think that's really good medium small to medium tree do ask if there's a cultivar available because there's there are they're out there and they are superior to the massive one my view holly yours yeah look i think that once you get to that sort of small to medium tree a whole range of different options open up i think and i know i've so i've got coastal banksias at my place banksia integrifolias which are not good for canopy because they're kind of a they don't have the the density in the leaves structure they're a lot more open but in terms of they have beautiful flowers on them mine are flowering at the moment then they're not going to take up as much room they tend to grow a little bit more vertical yeah they're going to provide a really great resource for and India also has some really good cultivars or yes. varieties they've been selected for varieties and like you say flowering now and they flower through the winter mm-hmm. and into the summer they are they are a great resource if there are no other nectar plants around. So I totally endorse that. Um, and I guess the payoff with, with some of those banksias too that you don't get with something like a bottle brush or a gravis as much is the cone at the end. Mm-hmm. So you've got that great seed pod that cockatoos are, are, going to, are going to come through and use as well. So it, it just has that extra little resource on the end um, of the flowering season that um, is going to be useful. Have I jumped the gun there too? I don't know. Can you see number four? Yes, Thank I can. You. Serrata or Integrifolia. So Excellent. It's very difficult to, to separate them. Also, all these choices, that, please, these are not prescriptive. Mm. Wet soil. You're going to want a different one, you know, than if you've got really dry soil. But these are just places to start. I might add, I am happy to help anybody 
with some plant selection issues. But if you want me to do that, you're going to have to give me some information so that I can give you good information back. Large shrub, Holly. Yes. What have you got? I've gone for a grevillea here because it's my absolute favourite for for many reasons. Grevillea, do you know grevillea? It's a New South Wales native. It's a coastal New South Wales native. It has bluey green flowers that are really insignificant, but they're held back in the shrub. But it's really dense. It loves shade, will perform in a fair amount of sun. Don't plant it out in the middle of a lawn where it's going to get baked. But near a fence, in that difficult spot in the garden because it's shady, it will perform. But the thing I love about it is it has, it's got nice long leave, quite decorative, but it's really dense. The Gonus Flex that is sold everywhere that is the West Australian peppermint, but mm-hmm. the dwarf variety that's really dense, like mm-hmm. Charisia is like that. It flowers into the winter, right through the winter, so it's a great resource, but it's dense. It's a shelter plant. It's a shelter belt plant. And it's a difficult spot plant. Doesn't mind getting inundated with a lot of rain as long as it will dry out. I think if the brush turkey can handle it, Shiresi I will handle it. It's that kind of it's that kind of plant. I've got bracketed with it a melaleuca. Mm-hmm. So there and there are dozens of melaleucas that will do this job where we are looking at being a shelter plant. I'm not picking a melaleuca for a nectar or anything like that. It's just because it's a dense foliage plant. And the other one I've selected is Hakea suaviolens, which is the sweet Hakea, I think is its common name, but it's prickly. It, If you don't prune it, it can become a medium, a small tree, but if you regularly prune it, it will be a beautiful, dense, large shrub and it's a refuge plant that's how i use it has the other advantages that it can survive being burnt in a fire so do you know that one holly yeah my my suggestion was going to be hakea sericea as as, that would be the they're interchangeable pretty much suave islands perhaps is handles the wet feet a bit better Mm -hmm. sericea is native to Melbourne, Gippsland, right through the coastal port portion of oh, it's probably the southern half of New South Wales, I think. I'd have to look at look it up. I don't know how far north it goes, but yeah. Fantastic habitat plant for wrens, thornbills, yeah. small honey eaters. Great um, nesting site. It's yeah, the the, the prickly nature yeah. is just perfect for small birds. Yep. So we we're agreed on that one. Small shrub is the next category. And if you I hope that you are understanding how I'm going. It's that layers that we've talked about before and that birds and animals all have a vertical zone that they live in and that they they feed in. Where they breed might be different to where they feed, so we need to think Mm -hmm. about those levels. Gee, someone's just messaged me too. How's that, Holly? So small shrubs. I've put in another Acacia paradoxa, which is a, pr- a prickly one, and I've said Leptospermum, and I've left that open because there are literally hundreds of varieties. But again, habitat plant, unbelievably good for attracting insects, which is the main reason that I've gone for it <laughs> other than some of the others. Prickly leaf Leptospermum, but if you are... If you're one of those people that is really sensitive to the to the leaf prickles, a lot of people react badly to it. You can uh-huh. pick one of the cultivars, which is from the Petersonii, the lemon-scented group, and there are small ones which have a rounded leaf, still smell, still smell nice, and still have the the same sort of flower, but won't bring you out in a rash. What's your small shrub selection? Oh, look, my, my small shrub selection that I've got in my garden that I really love, I've got a, I've got a couple. So I've got a Grevillea sericea, yep. which is a pink spider flower. Yep, yep. 
So from the again, Conroy, yes, yeah. yeah. I've said before, when people go grevillea, they tend to go big or bug go home in terms of the flowers. But I think the na- the native grevilleas, the non hybridized like cerisias or speciosas or the one that Roses. you get exactly small flowers, incredibly delicate and beautiful. They they are just as beautiful. They're just a small flower, and they're easier for small birds to get access to, a little bit cha- more challenging for some of the bigger aggressive species. And Sericea, at least, the pink spider flower is prickly too, so it's got that little bit of an element of shelter as well. So that's my kind of nectar one. Pink I also, spider. yeah, that's what I get blue-banded bees hanging around mine, like it's great. One that's really easy to get a hold of is Western yeah. Coastal Rosemary. You can get everywhere. So it's going to be great for shelter. It's grows really dense you can prune it you can shape it you can do just about anything to it and it's going to be creating that really nice dense habit and is also going to be good for attracting insects i've got that going in my garden as well and then what else have i got corias as well so it's a small shrub yeah i i didn't put the corea in over the leptospermum and the reason i didn't even though i love corias i think corias are the same there's a, a, a bunch of them, is that we tend to, we tend to in our gardens have plenty of options for nectar feeding birds. True. Even in the suburb like mine, there's going to be camellias, there's going to be fuchsias, there's going to be a whole lot of things that my neighbours have that the honey eaters will, will get access to. But the thing that we are lacking and that we've removed from the suburbs is shelter space again because everything's got to be tidy and yeah a bit of a hobby horse we've all got those places where the elderly residents sold the people in their 60s or 70s and a year later there's three townhouses and with one ornamental plant in a pot by the door and a couple of bloody mondo grasses along the path which is just from a horticulturist and design garden design point of view it's the most boring unoriginal and wasted space you could possibly have but that's life now i've got two more sections holly and then we'll go into the viewer or listener choices and, and kick around some of the issues and some of the great choices i've gone for tufting and clumping for my mm-hmm. next two and i haven't gone to the species or even the genus level here but for grasses, I've gone with your local poa or danthonia. Yes. So that's the, in landscape terms here in Melbourne, you'll find poa is being used everywhere, but there's a lot of poas and you can get the indigenous one for your area. And the other one is the danthonia, the wallaby grass, flowering at different times and slightly different in their resilience to being cut and clipped Mm -hmm. and whatnot, but a really good filler and pathway edger. And pigeons love them, finches love them, the wrens use them, so that's or the fairy wrens, let's be correct, would be my suggestion there. And then on the other side is more the strap leaves, and I would say the lamandras, again, the species so many available, and the Dianellas, which are the fri- fringe lily Dianellas? No. Lily? Dionia is a fringe lily. What are we calling I just call them Dianellas, lily or whatever they call them. And the, yeah, and Lamandras are called native flaxes. And, yeah. But just go with the, go into your nursery and say, Lamandras, can you show me? Now, there'll be lots of, I think there was a, company called Oz Plants, I think, that went for a whole lot of different designer kind of smaller and bluer and please, if you can, just buy the regular run of the mill because they set seed and rosellas love them. Things like red rumps will come in and have a crack at them and when they've left a lot of mess, that's when the other birds will come in and and pick off what they haven't, they haven't gone with so what are your tufting ones? You notice I've left out kangaroo paws? A kangaroo grass. Oh, I didn't put okay. kangaroo paws in my, no? in my tufting or clumping ones. 
That's kangaroo paws are the bane of my them. existence. I can't grow them. I love them. I probably am. No, I, I don't think I've got good great drainage where I put them. I think I put them in the wrong spot. Yeah, which means um, you need you, you need kangaroo paws. The reason I don't recommend them is for that reason is that mm-hmm. they get – there are promo labels on them telling you how fantastic they are mm-hmm. and people will buy them because oh, I've got the red and green one. And, 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 and. No, buy the junk. Actually, fight, ring up your local landscaper who is redoing – a big area and the chances are that they've dug up big clumps of red kangaroo paw or green mm-hmm. kangaroo paw and are going to take them to the tip. And I say that seriously, mm-hmm. ring up landscape contractors and say, have you got any crap that you're throwing out? <laughs> Often there will be clumps of lament, all this stuff which is no longer popular or mm-hmm. your council might be removing stuff too and you might find that you can pick up, don't, don't get agapanthers, but you just treat them the same way. You get in there, you hack them up, and you plant them. That would be my thought there. Um, yeah, look, I, I've planted some kangaroo prawns at my in-laws' place that have just looked amazing. The big standard, they are beautiful. I, I just got them in the right spot there. I've planted them at my place and 10 k's away, and they've just not, they're not doing well. They're, it's a little bit too damp where I put them in, so they do need really great drainage. If you can get them to flower, they're just such a lovely statement piece, I think, in the garden, but it's a challenge. I don't recommend them when we're talking about a choice of two or three in a category because, again, the generally it's not the honey, it's not the nectar-feeding no. birds that can't find enough to eke out an existence. Mm-hmm. It's generally the other habitat things that we want. And lamandras, poas, danthonias, infinitely superior for providing. Yeah. In the east of in the. Sorry, WA people. We would need to do a whole different. Show. That's a whole which another. Which we probably will, Holly, when we come to think about that. I, th- I think we should. I think WA has such a amazing, diverse plant range of plants and. And yeah. up to yes, because people might have noticed that in the. In my little ad that I was doing on Twitter about doing the survey, I had a Grevillea leucops was the flower in that, which I grew at my nursery, and it's one of my favourites. It's one of the ones that is the tropical kind of Grevillea with the long spear with the flower head out on the end, but it's fragrant, and the moths love it. The bur- uh, the and bats are attracted to the to the scent, but it's really showy. But it's one of those tropical and desert grevilleas that have those beautiful big flowers mm-hmm. that we're saying steer away from the even the Robin Gordons, the grevillea superbs, the misty pinks, all that kind of stuff. They're beautiful, but but anyway. At, but as you've said, they support the lazy birds. Mm-hmm. That's the way I. That's the way I see it. I like to see the. I like and- to see the hard working birds, and I'm always been. Indigenous, if you can, but yes. there are lots of places in Australia where the indigenous nursery either doesn't exist mm-hmm. or what is more frequent doesn't have stock for the the homeowner because they're growing for Greening Australia or the Reveg Group or a Landcare Group or something like that. So they are they're generally volunteers or running on the smell of an oily rag, mm-hmm. yeah, and they don't have a a showroom, so to speak. So you can't just rock down there and go, I'd like 75 powers, please. I go, sorry, we haven't got any stock. And we should all be growing them ourselves, I believe. That's a whole nother show. That's a whole nother show. It? That's a whole nother show. My last category, Holly, is ground yep. covers. Okay. And I've got one where I've got a definite recommendation. Mm-hmm. This is my number one recommendation for most situations, and it's Myoporum parvifolium. Nice. And it comes in a couple of leaf forms, but really reliable, very dense forming mat, great for slopes, but it's so good here that in Melbourne here, my local council uses it around the shopping precinct where they have the mall bit, and it's in the garden beds. They've been trying eremophilas as well. Oh, nice. Myoporums the ones that handle the foot traffic, people backing up over them. 
because they can't park their cars, people dumping shopping trolleys on them. So a really good, useful ground cover will moderate soil temperatures because they are very dense. Again, insect, they will bring in insects, but they have a fruit. So they've got some use. Pigeons and ground foraging parrots will also go for them if they're in the right spot. And my last one in this section is three. I've got, you make it, make a choice. Okay. Canedia, and you can virtually use, you probably get half a dozen Canedias in your area you can choose from. But please ask the question, is it known for weed potential in your area? Because some of them are terrible in some parts of the country. So please ask. But Canedias, they'll give you reward very quickly and they'll go up, they'll go across, and they're great ground covers. You can mow them Mm -hmm. once they get established, which is where they're great for an area around a path or anything. We'll handle heavy soils, some of the species, as well as really free-draining soils. Then I've said pick a ground cover grevillea if you have that kind of spot. Royal mantle, even though I'd say it's a cultivar, is a fantastic one for a difficult spot in full sun. And I've put a banksia in because you can get the prostrate grevillea, the grevillea, banksia serrata, you can get integrifolia, Mm -hmm. and then there's a bunch of the West Australians that are ground cover grevilleas, uh, ground cover grevilleas, banksias, ground cover banksias, and they would be my third choice in that category. What would you pick? So my so I've done Canidia prostrata at my place and it they went a little too well. That's good but that's good because the Canidia prostrata is did you get the indig Yes I did. So the running postman the local local, yep. 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 So you're able Um, to get local stock. They set a lot of seed but mm -hmm. they can be very difficult to find like a lot of Canadian pros- prostata in Melbourne just don't take. And I think the reason for it is that we have improved the hell out of our soils in that the, you don't know where your soil has come yep. from if you're in a new area and it may be full of all sorts of fertilisers. It might have come, might have been scalped from farmland or it might have been from a, where a chook shed used to be. And often I think the nutrient load is too high. Yep. So they don't take. But then you put in something like Canedia rubicundra, the, one of the red ones from Western Australia, and they will go, bah! go crazy. I just want to interrupt. Sorry, Holly, because yep. we've got yeah. a comment here. Okay. And this, is, this has been really topical on Twitter for the UK, and I actually want to okay. talk about it. So Janice, hello, Janice, from Facebook. Recently saw an article regarding No Mo May in the UK, and this has been really big on Twitter in the UK. Don't mow everything. Stop being tidy. Let stuff go back to meadows. That's really the concept that they've Mm -hmm. had in the UK. Because a lot of the wildflowers of the UK have, over the hundreds of years, been improved into a lot of the the flowers that that we purchase, primulas and things like that, in, in nurseries. So the idea about being less tidy, Janice, she probably missed the very start of the of the show where it drives me mad, this compunction to be tidy. As you tidy up your yard, you just remove habitat for insects, which means you remove habitat for reptiles and amphibians and all the birds that want to pop along the ground, all the fairy wrens and the brown thornbills and whatnot, who are and the scrub wrens that will march along the in their family groups and just clean up every insect as they as they get from one side of your yard to another. So, can we do it in Australia? We've got a different habitat. We've got a different environment. It's harder. Fire risk is a real problem, and we have so many environmental weeds in in the seed bank in the soil that if we're not maintaining an area, if we're just saying, I'll oh, just let it be, I would say in most places in Melbourne and Sydney and Wollongong where you are, Holly, you're probably not going to get the desired result. You need to be maintaining the area. 
So I'm all for letting it go, but not if you're not going to be going in three or four times a year and removing bone seed, for example. Geraniums, people, agapanthus, wherever you have an area that looks like it's unkempt, some idiot's going to come along in the middle of the night on <laughs> Saturday night going into Sunday morning because he's just gone and cleaned up Aunt Gladys's agapanthus and he's going to dump the rubbish somewhere and then this is a really big problem. It happens in our park across the road from me. Oh. But, it, but it's the, look, I don't want to use any brand names, but it's your local lawnmower maintenance guys and the people who are cleaning up when they're moving out of places and stuff, dumping crap in the park. And that stuff gets moved around and falls off trucks as they're moving. And there aren't many tips anymore. This is one of the things where, or if you've got to go to the tip, to dump a trailer is going to cost you 80 bucks. So people don't do it. So let's not grow them to start with. But going back to Janice's point, yeah, a wild, dense, planted plot is a great idea. Mm -hmm. Letting your – I just like to see the leaf litter and all that stuff. Instead of putting everything in your compost bin, I like to have 10, 10 to 15 centimetres of leaf litter in all the shrubbery areas, under all the trees. That does the same kind of thing. But in Australia, we don't want, in fire-prone areas, an unkempt understory in a residential area and on the fringes. Because every time we have a fire season that is damaging, what that means is that the calls are then out to clear areas of bush rather than maintain fire zones. We get the calls now to go and get rid of bushland. It's just nuts. Just don't live in it. If anyway, that's a whole other area. Janice, do you want to follow up on that? Because um, I am, I'm a big proponent for letting it go wild, but not it, that doesn't. It's a balance, mean, yeah. It doesn't mean you're not maintaining it. Yeah, that's right. And there's certainly a whole range of lovely native wildflowers that you could plant out in an area rather than necessarily letting a whole heap of lawn just go nuts. You could maybe try a little bit, a little patch of lawn and see what, yeah. what grows up, but I, I wouldn't broad scale. I it. am a big fan of the verge, but mm -hmm. some councils won't let you do the verge. But hey, check out what Costa's done on Gardening Australia with his verge. Our local council doesn't encourage it, but if you do plant out your verge, they're not removing it. But some councils will remove it, so you need to check. I'll give a shout out. My council has a is actually encouraging you to plant out your verge now. They have a great um, scheme going at the moment, uh, which is really great. Okay, now here's Kim's contribution. So strategically mow, yes, definitely around that. Leave some areas to go to seed. There we go. Uh, Kim, I once designed a water system, a firefighting system for someone who lived in Mount Macedon. And it was protect a historic garden and and whatnot. And with the it was a irrigation system as well as a fire prevention system, two pumps for redundancy, a big tank, controllers, and I think it ran to something like fifteen thousand dollars when we worked it out. But it had a ring main, so it so you could maintain it at a high pressure that the CFA could utilise if need be, a portable pump and a fixed pump, two tanks, a uh, whole lot of stuff. The guy decided against it because it was too expensive and then he drove away in a $180,000 car. And guess what? He lost his house in a fire. So I don't want to say that to, to say stupid or he deserved it or anything like that. I'm just sort of saying there are ways to protect your properties if you need to that are a lot better investment than a new car. That's my view. I would be, uh, let, let's have comments on that. What do you reckon, Holly? I could, I could cop some crap about that one. So. Have you ever lived in the bush, Holly? That's a, no, no, I haven't. Because there's very different things you have to consider to do. I have, yeah, sure. and I grew up in the country, and so that I was in junior fire brigade and all, mm -hmm. all that stuff. I am sometimes puzzled by the choices people make when fire is a, it's a real live threat 
Mm-hmm. But then the uh, yeah, here we go, Kim. Yeah, this is Kim said metal high sprinklers with buried pipes. Yes, absolutely. That was what we were using around around the house. Rainbird P seventy somethings, I think, were the were the sprinkler and the Nan sprinklers. I remember those brands. But the other thing too is have that carpet with those kind of sprinklers on around your eaves, which protect, totally protect your house. And if you live in those areas, four or 5,000 bucks for a, a big tank is a good investment, but you must make it fireproof too. So you need to put a rain curtain on it, otherwise a plastic tank will melt. But that's a whole nother thing. We're here to talk, not to talk about <laughs> fires, but, but there, there's ways where you can have a wild garden that is not a risk to yourself. And that's really the point I want want to get out there. Plant selection has a lot to do with that too, particularly the way the canop- you, canopies work and the way fires behave. And there's certain plants that you should not be planting as shrubberies in fire-prone areas. But that's that's a different thing. And I'd be happy to explore that with anyone who would like to, at Bird Emergency on Twitter or Grant at thebirdemergency.com via email if you want to uh, take that up. Holly, we asked people to fill in a, uh, a questionnaire. The first question, I just said, if let's, let's set the scene. The, question, the questionnaire was really, you can only pick three plants to put in your bird or wildlife-friendly garden. What would your first choice be? And Holly, it was fantastic. Almost 40 responses, which I was pretty happy about. Now we've, we're both looking at this. We've got some really good. Someone was right on your your wavelength. Would you like me to quickly run through it and then we'll pick? The Please high? go for it. Okay. I don't know who the person was who went in and answered number one to everything, but that's what they did. But then we've got Banksia's small flowering eucalypt. That was we've already talked about that. Yep. Coria right. hind marsh, green coria, which mm-hmm. is a beauty. Calisman, Acacia paradoxa, now that's a prickly one, which we've talked about. Wastringer for the small birds, Eucalypts for the big birds. Banksia, Acacia, Grevillea teratifolia, or Grevillea honey gem. Now, again, they're big. Teratifolia is an arid, yellow-flowered Grevillea, which is a ripper. Honey gem has a flower that looks just like it, but it's one of those um, tropical hybrids. Then we've got calistamins, and we've got natives, e.g. bottle brush. Prick, a prickly bush, that's the way I like to think, hakea, grevillea, or wattle. Now, number 14, before we got to lily pillies. Holly, do you have a view on lily pillies, which are acmena or syzygium yeah. or yep. eugenias in Australia? They, they play a role. I don't have a huge problem with them, provided they're in the right spot. They've got a lovely fruit, so that's good for the little silver eyes or fig birds or some of the pigeons, some of the... Um, yeah, the fruit pigeons and the... Fruit-eating pigeons fruit as well. Much more reliable and a much better choice when you get to Sydney and further north yep. than they are in... Where it's well. they, yep. they can be a heartbreak plant for people yep. in in Melbourne, but Acmena smithii, which was the original lily pilly and had a lot of popularity in the 60s and yep. 70s. Can be very messy, but also can get very oversized. Yes. So that's why I don't recommend it because often people think they're getting a small sort of shrub. They get sold as a great plant for a hedge. Yeah. Yes. Rock out your neighbours and the next thing you know, you've got a buddy, you've got a 10 metre, <laughs> 10 metre high tree yep. uh, that drops a lot of fleshy, fruits and they stain yes. so that is one of the reasons i don't recommend it but if you're up further north go for one of the syzygiums yes the smaller and you can there's a lot of them available now really reliable smaller and you can get the white fruiting ones too now which are yeah they don't stain so that's yeah good. i've got a couple at my place some of the, the little dwarf ones growing at the uh, moment which can you remember which one? I can't you got? remember off the top of my head. I literally got them at a discount one day and went, "Oh, ex- excellent! I'm going to grab them while yeah. they're marked down." Yeah. But yeah, one of the one of the smaller formed ones, but really reliable, growing really well. Haven't had any major issues with them at all. 
we thought really carefully about where they were going to go. Fabulous in a, like, at your door in a big Mm -hmm. pot. They're they're magnificent specimen plants. So Mm -hmm. let me give them a big tick for that. Mm -hmm. I'll keep going down the list. Grevillea, Silverbanks, Albany, or Albany, I don't know which one's correct. The Woolly Bush, which is really popular now. I would suggest if you have those, prune them regularly and take some cuttings and give them to all your neighbours so that they grow so easily from cutting. Just stick them in a... get. You'd have to get a sharp sand to grow them without rotting, but, gee, they'll grow in anything and, yeah, they're really good. Again, a good specimen bush, if you can get the upright variety, great for along a fence or along a driveway too. You can use them as a, like a Christmas tree alternative, yep. I yep. think. Yeah, they've got that sort of look. Of- yep, and really conducive to pruning. They shoot really quick. They respond to hard pruning. They're also good anywhere anywhere you want to block off and and quickly something that's three, three or four metres tall. They can really quickly block off up to you your neighbours' eaves and stuff like that. But, yeah, but I think they're quite short-lived in Melbourne anyway. Bottle brush, eucalypt, flowering natives, salvias. Now, that was that's a really good suggestion. Salvias. <laughs> Two people said salvias. Now, they're not native. Oh. They are the sage. You can get lots of colours. They grow quickly, but they're great for promoting insects and some yeah. of the birds the spine bills and whatnot will get into them as well. Pretty easy to maintain too. You can let them go to seed, so you can just run them to seed and you might get in a wild kind of meadow like we were talking about yep. before. They might come back in a herbaceous border. That's what I was looking for. So, yeah, really good suggestion. Our first non-native, and I'm glad that we oh, – I did mention camellias, didn't I, and fuchsias earlier on – Coria glabra, that's a rip. Just going through. Someone's mentioned the kangaroo apple. Now, that's a good one. Now, kangaroo apples are solanums, which are in the same family as tomatoes and the deadly nightshade, all those kind of things. But the kangaroo apple is uh, a native that is one of the first colonisers after bushfire or clearing. So, yeah, look good. Really nice purple flowers. What else? We've got eucalyptus, carimbias, red grevilleas, bottle brush, calistamum grevillea, and then the last one I love, shrubs. Now, neither of us has recommended a a bottle brush. I think bottle brushes have their place, but when I have to pick, like I did in my exercise, one or two in each category, Mm -hmm. no, I didn't get one, but in a larger Air, like if you've got a half acre block or something, I reckon you're going to need calismans, but I would be only doing them as part of a mixed planting would be my thought. Holly? Yeah, look, I, I agree. I didn't put them on my list at all because I think they're, 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 they're everywhere anyway on any typical suburban block, at least around my place, there is yeah. plenty of them around. The street like trees too, that's right. Them. Yeah, yeah. I, I, That's why like a lot of my suggestions, I think like yours, Grant, really focused on insect attracting or shelter providing plants rather than ones that are going to provide nectar. And of the ones that we've suggested that provide nectar, I think they're, they give another bonus as well. They're, they're either being good for shelter or, or likewise. So, yeah, look, I don't have a particularly outstanding bottle brush. There's plenty of options out there. I would just... Like you said, Grant, not make if you if you're short on space, if you've got a very a typical smaller yard, which most of us have now, I wouldn't use the space to put in a bottle brush. I'd be adding some of those other key resources before I put in one. But if you have the space and you've got a whole range of insect attracting plants and some really seed attracting plants, and you've got some other things in there, then maybe a bottle brush added to the garden is is going to be okay too. I just wouldn't make them the first port of call. No, I'm, I'm the same. And there's myoporums and eriostomans and there's just so many other things that, too. Yeah. that could be used. Now, I'm going to 
quickly go through some of the interesting ones because once we went to number two and number three, we're seeing the same things yeah. popping up. But there's something here that I think I'm hoping it's changed its name because I don't actually know it. So I'm going to look it up Ooh. in a second. But the Golden Pender was an interesting yes. suggestion here. So how about you give us your thoughts on the Golden Pender and another one which cropped up, which I really thought long and hard about, which was the Clematis, the, black, the native Clematis or Clematis, okay. depending on, on which school you went to. What do, so what do you, you think about the Golden Pender? Look, I mean, there are much more northern species, so they're Queensland, subtropical and warm temperate type plant type tree they can grow really large so they can i think in a garden they're probably not going to grow quite as large as they would in a natural setting but you're looking at an up to 10 meter tall tree with this huge flurry of yellow flowers i think they're probably like some of the bottle brush and things they've, they've got a, a good place in that sort of subtropical type setting for some of those larger honey eaters and Fry birds and probably fig birds would come in and visit them as well, I would think. But yeah, what do you think? Yep, we don't see many of them down here, but really, again, really reliable the further north you go. Terrific in Brisbane. But I, I do sometimes wonder about weed potential with it too. Now, I, I'm not aware of it, but it is, it's really easy to grow in disturbed soils. So, I just wonder about about that. But if you are Brisbane and surrounds a north, then it's it's right in your in its natural range, so it's a good Definitely. choice in those situations. Definitely. The clematis or clematis, mm. there's a couple of native species. A really good choice, I think, in some places. They like a dense sort of a semi-shaded situation where they will thrive. But another one you can consider if you're looking for a light climber is the Glycine clandestina as well, dainty. Oh, and the Bellardieras, let's not leave them out too. They've got a fruit and, yeah, they're, they're, all, they're all good. I'm not sure I would pick a Clematis, a native Clematis, for a shady or a covering up kind of purpose instead of a canedia. But again, that would depend on the aspect. But yeah. Now, Holly, I just want to bring up the other one, which I thought was a really interesting choice for Melbourne particularly, which is the tree violet or the Malacitis dentata. Yeah, nice suggestion. Good guess. I'm guessing that I don't know who I don't know who put it. I can probably match it up if I wanted to, but I'm not going to go to that effort. But I, that sounds like something that Ben Cordes might have put in the list. Ben the botanist, very nice. Now in that second list, we've got a couple of others that hadn't been we haven't brought up before. Hibertias, excellent, really good for small and clumping kind of plants, really delicate, but you've also got the Hibertia scandens, which is the snake vine, showy big yellow flower. Yes, good excellent climber. So, yes, can go bonkers if it really likes its spot, A really good for clambering through other shrubs would be a good thought. And I like it when people put in not sure. As an answer, that's a very that's a, a valid answer, and that's why nurserymen out there. Someone from Western Australia has put the ma the Mary, so that's a big tree. I would mm. go for that if, like we were discussing, and there have been a few suggestions for kangaroo paws as number two. So that was number two. Let me close that one. Where are we? I'm having trouble with my. Uh, one that we haven't talked about that I think was certainly on my list, which I didn't mention in the large shrubs and I think popped up a few times in the surveys, is Kunzias. Or as I would say, Kun oh, Sorry. Uh, and again, you will find Kunzia Baxteri in just about every nursery. <laughs> if there's another one, pick the other one, please, because Kunzia Baxteri 
can fall apart, can be a source of borer for other, that will then invade other plants. Mm -hmm. Very showy, lots of nectar, but there are better. And there's a couple that when people got to the third plant, these are where the best, I reckon the best suggestions have come in. Would you like me to just yep. highlight a few of them? Well, we've got Banksia marginata. We hadn't talked about that, mm -hmm. but again, fabulous for particularly Melbourne and Sydney. I would call that a small tree or large shrub. Fantastic varieties available too. Someone selected the tree ferns. Someone's made a comment to me because the question I said, I've severely restricted your choice. You've got one more. So that was number three, and they've put you rotter. <laughs> but they've got a eucalyptus charter boma. Not suitable for most gardens. Pick a small one. And they're suggesting try and get some mistletoe seeds and get that going. That's a really good idea. Euodia is in here. Euodia is an interesting plant. In in Melbourne, it's used as an architectural kind of specimen, but I think uh, a bit further north, it might be a really good one. But here's a great habitat plant that I'm not about. The sweet Bursaria. Bursaria, great for seed eaters, great for insects when they're flowering, has a lovely perfume, can be rangy and untidy, so if you have a bigger block, it's a really good one. If you're prepared to prune it regularly, yeah. anyone can use it. It's a great habitat plant. So I go absolutely with that. Tufting plant, yellow buttons or the craspedias. Beautiful looking. Again, butterflies love them. Beetles also love them. So they're one of my favourites in my garden, I have to say. Not necessarily directly bird attracting, but great for insects. And they just look delightful. And their the little flowers are there all the time. They're beautiful. Yep. And if you don't particularly want the big billy button flowers mm. that you see in all the books, buy some seed and spread it so you get the smaller ones mm -hmm. uh, self and come up. They're less spectacular but equally as attractive for the the insects particularly. But it won't break the bank because a mm -hmm. lot of times those, you get one plant and it's quite expensive for what it does and if it, they get a bit wet, they can fail. So I would look up something like Nindathana or some of the other mm -hmm seed merchants and buy the seed and spread it around especially if kim like you were saying uh, earlier on that idea of a meadow or a, a wild area yeah get some native flower seeds i might make a list for that actually holly because i need to think a bit more about uh, about which ones but i think that's a really good idea to pursue so banksias grevilleas melaleucas Tea trees, which are the leptospermums, lily pillies, flowering gums. But someone said a strawberry. I like that idea. It comes ambigua. Oh, okay. I was going to say yeah. that's not a sort of a Melbourne-y kind of common name. Oh. So, yeah, okay. So, so that's, I've got that in my garden. That's one of my favourite. Is, is that the white one, the white flower yes. one? Yeah. Which species is that one? Let me. That's um, Kunzia ambigua. Ambigua, yeah. Yeah, so otherwise known as the tick bush, which I think will yeah. probably put a lot of people off. But, yeah, really great for shelter, really good for windbreaks, a good sort of stabilising soil too. Yeah, yeah, um, again, a, 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 a succession plant, really. Yeah, one. yeah, and nice and dense, attracts lots of insects. It's one of my favourites. Lavender mm. is in here as a suggestion. Now, as a sort of landscape garden plant, if again, if you're wanting to attract insects and bees, it's a beautiful choice. Not a lot of utility for many birds, but but for bringing in insects, yeah, good choice. Now here's one we didn't talk about in the ground covers, and I'm denied about it. The scavola or sevola, depending on which nursery you yep. first went to. Terrific. The fan flowers they are, if you're Beautiful. talking in common so names. Again, try and find a local variety, one that I wouldn't go for the showier ones. I would go for foliage as much as anything else with those. Great pick. I really like number 33, respondent number 33. I don't know who they are yet. 
anything that provides good protective cover from cats. And then they put in brackets because we're in the third choice list. Actually, this should have been my first choice. Yes, I agree. And then the next one was was grasses. So people have been thinking outside the box, which I think is Excellent. great. Gee, we got some good good suggestions there. Now the last no, not I don't want the last questions. Here we go. Number three. Oh, Ben Cordes was number six. Just having a look where people were coming from. Royal National Park, Port Hacking, the sandstone area of, uh -huh. of Sydney. Aranda in Canberra, 15 years ago. Oh, that was Julie. 15 years ago, planted native species such as eucalypts, banksias, grevilleas, grasses, dianellas. We've got to keep going. Nectar producing, blah, 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 blah. The wattle birds, yes, that's all the points she made about the boisterous ones. But she said they now have well established larger plants offering food and shelter to spinebills and other birds like thornbills, pardalotes, and silver eyes. Beautiful. So that's what you have to think about is that's why I approach it as you've got your canopy, you've got your medium, your small. They're going to mature at different times, mm -hmm. uh, but. As your garden matures, different birds will use will use it, and some of the residents will use it in different ways. Just looking, gee, we've got some good suggestions, really good suggestions. I think we'll we might have to do another. We will have to do another episode. Bendigo, Middleton Beach, Dan Fuller from Plants Grow Here, who we've done some uh, stuff with. Dan's in Glen Huntley. Oh, we've got a museum curator. Hello, Annette. Landscaper and retired horticulturist. Someone's main issue is providing food for pardalotes. Mm -hmm. Good on you. Yeah. Denise, who is a gardener, moved to the Dandenongs three years ago, pulled out most of the exotics because all they had were blackbirds and common miners. Yep. That's a very common problem. Someone in Kempsey, Penrith. A lot of people didn't put where they were from. And Northern Sydney. That was really good. I appreciate that everyone made those, took the time to to do the survey and give us all of that info. Now, I think I've just got, there's one more I wanted to look at. One, two, three. Yeah, this one. This is, again, going through the locations, looking for, where Old Bar in New South Wales. Do you know where that is, Holly? <laughs> So we've got Adelaide, we've got Alexandra in Victoria, so that's up near Lake Eildon, Melbourne, Western Sydney, Maclay Valley. So Maclay Valley, is that in the Hunter, near the up near the Hunter, or is that further north? I think that's further north. I could be okay. totally wrong. Might be up might be up Grafton-ish, I think. Collector. Collector's one of those those towns up near Canberra, isn't it? Yeah. So Old Bar is south of Port Macquarie, north of Foster. Okay. Okay, okay. So, well, they've, gee, actually, it, when you think about the, that area north of there with all the flooding that happened mm. right up, I really hope that we don't ever do our plant selections thinking about inundation unless you have a wet spot in your garden. Mm. Yep. But that's probably going to have to be something we think about more often because I don't think that flood events are going to be as unusual as we've thought about in the past. Yeah. Well, let's go up this list again. Mount Tambourine, a scenic rim, Brisbane, Melbourne, Albany, Bendigo, Gladstone, Sydney, Eltham again, Melbourne. Spiwa. Now, I'm guessing that's near Biwa and the the Sunshine Coast hinterland. I'm guessing. I'll look it up in a minute. Or maybe Holly, while I'm reading the list, yep. maybe you could look that one up. S P E W A H. I'm thinking it's going to be near Biwa, but we got a Tazzy one. Hello, Tazzy. Good on you. I'm on your peninsula down where I'm where not originally from. Is Spears? Yes, okay, great. So it's even further north. And then we've got Canberra and Stirling in South Australia. So that that was great, I think. It was a good exercise to go through. Let me come back into the studio because I was clicking around all over the place. Oh, there we go. Kim's just told us, mid-coast near Taree. Thank you. Now, Holly's just 
Ah, oh, fantastic, fantastic. Let's let's do that in a second. Now, all the people with the eyes on us. Hello, Facebook. Hello, Twitch. It's not. I, I like it when we've got someone from Twitch. Mm -hmm. Especially when they're not putting naughty comments in. I tend to find the Twitch people put in naughty comments. Oh. Right now. Do you have a question, anybody who, that you would like to put to us or a comment? And actually, for those of you who are with us, would you like us to do something like this again and maybe have a slightly different attack on it? Or maybe we... I don't know, I'd, I'd be happy to actually go through and uh, recommend a planting list for someone if they were prepared to give us uh, lots of information. They could volunteer for that, save you about... That would be fun. Save you a couple of thousand dollars with your local land, <laughs> landscape designer. Yeah, I'd really like to get some pe maybe people from around the country to join us. Holly, did anyone from BirdLife actually give you their... Favourites, because that was where we started with this little project. We were going to try and get some of the bird life folk who work with different mm. interests, different particular interests, to to put some favourites in. Or do we need to do we need to give them a longer lead time? To we need to give them a longer time. lead time for sure. And I will put the screws on them and get them to give me um, their favourite plants. Because yeah, we've got staff all around the country. Yeah. They even if they're working on all sorts of Birds in the bush or shorebirds or whatever, they've all got some I was thinking, out favourites. Maybe, maybe we can, uh, and, and I'll chase down maybe some previous guests on the show to talk about which plants that they would recommend for their particular fave mm -hmm. birds, like for the woodland birds or if you're in Tassie. Now, we know that the 40 spotted partalote needs the manna gums, so what are some good plants that will mix in the garden if you wanted to plant some manna gums? Because you want to have a nice looking garden and a functional garden and all those kind of, kind of things, but maybe you want to help out as well. Swifties and let's, yeah. Uh, so if you're interested in that, let us know, people, because it's, it's a bit of fun doing something a bit, a bit different. It's a bit like homework for us, and that can sometimes be good. It's nice to complete an assignment sometimes, isn't it, Holly? Depends what mark you get at the end, Grant. Oh, look, even if you fail, you don't really fail because it's just an opportunity to, to succeed next time. That's, that's right. Now, so I'm putting the call out again, Kim and all the others with your eyes on us. Is there anything else you want us to tackle before we um, shoot off? Oh, let me remind you too that in an hour's time, I'll be talking to Brom and Isaac about handling owls and generally some other raptors. I think we might talk about in the Wear glove. Yes, there's ten. There's a ten step process. So, but we got the question on Twitter. Doctor Nick on Twitter asked, "How how do you handle the owls?" Mm -hmm. After I put the Bromans powerful owl episode out, so I thought, hey. Why not? Why not extend it more than a two hundred and forty characters on Twitter, which is what we've done. Thanks, Kim. I'll put that one up. There we go. So you can see it too, Holly. Thanks. It has been a good discussion. Holly, is there anything coming up in Birdlifeville that you want to talk about? Look, there always is. Off the top of my head, I can't think of much. Birdsinbackyards dot net. It's where I update any. Anything in the urban birds team that's coming up, we're going to be doing the Gang Cockatoo Project round two. So if you are anywhere within the Gang Gang's natural distribution and you want to learn about them, go to birdsinbackyards.net and there's a link there. You can register to do a little e-learning course and take some action for Gang Cockatoos. We're just finishing up the first round now and it's been amazing. We'll maybe talk about that another day, Grant. I should have made a note. Did you see that someone had mentioned me in Twitter, talk, directed something to me and, and a few others, they'd seen some gang gangs and they were actually in a, in a part of Melbourne that I wouldn't have thought gang gangs oh. So there's always two ways to look at that. Isn't that mm. fantastic? Gang gangs there. The other thing is, oh, my God, there's nowhere to, for them to <laughs> bloody live. So they've turned up where they would never normally be. Yes. So there's always two ways to look at those yeah. kind of situations. But if you've never seen a gang, 
You will hear them probably before you see them, mm -hmm. and you cannot mistake their call for anything else. Holly, how would you describe it? Creaking door. I think of it as opening a red wine bottle that, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, that you're pulling the cork out. Um, Maybe I need so, to crack open a 20-year-old bottle or yeah, something and test it. Creaky door, definitely, or the pulling a cork out of a, an old wine bottle is the, mm. although who does that anymore? When was the last time you bought a wine? Actually, I can't even think of the last time I bought a bottle of wine, but do they still have corks, any of them anymore? Some of them do. Yeah, I, I think, think I know a little bit too much about ones. this topic. Yeah, and I've, yeah, so I've got some old ones stored. Maybe that'll be the next time I open one, I'll be listening for a game. Definitely. Holly, I know we ge we generally do this, we try to do it every two weeks, but mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you might like to get together, where are we looking at my calendar, next week mm -hmm. for a particular reason, the weekend following the 14th is World Migratory Bird Day. Mm -hmm. And I thought perhaps we could give it a bit of a Bird Life Australia flavour and talk about the migratory birds that bird life have interest groups or study groups yep. for. And perhaps sure. we could uh, see if we could get a contribution or two from some of the Bird Life gang talking about migratory birds. So, I will see what I can rustle up. Yeah, so I just thought that because otherwise we'd be doing it the, a couple of days after, after. World Migratory <laughs> Bird Day and I'll hear what would be the bloody point. And I'm not sure if there's any events because it doesn't seem to be as big a deal in Australia as it is mm -hmm. for the rest of the world. But I've got a couple of episodes coming out. We're going to talk about the Prairie Warbler. I recorded an episode with Jared Hitchens about that. And hopefully, I'm hoping we're going to be talking about um, cowbirds, which are like cooker, because there's a great hashtag on Twitter, <laughs> Prow, which is O W, Prow and Cow. How cool is that? And any excuse to talk about that. And I'm talking about pitters. I've got an episode about pitters, cool. which are migratory, and yes. the whole talking about bird strike. And David Tan, who I spoke with, sent me half a dozen pictures, one of him holding a bird, one of a pitter that was alive, and four of them pitters that were dead, that had hit buildings in Singapore yep. and dropped to the ground. So we're going to talk about that and hopefully also cover the Dark Skies month or Dark Skies week, which we're yep. sort of in, but the whole idea and what we can do about that. Is anyone in bird life working on that? Actually, So I've done a bit of work on bird strike in the Urban Birds team. I've had, had staff member working on bird strike. So we've got a, a little resource for what homeowners can do to minimise chances of bird strike around their place. So that's on birdsinbackyards.net if anybody wants to have a look. Yeah. To that too. Yeah. We did a little project starting to explore how widespread the issue is in Australia because I don't we don't have a massive handle on it yeah. like in the US and through North America. But the so, numbers are staggering. Yeah, staggering. Absolutely uh, staggering. Yeah. Actually, so it's definitely an issue here. I don't think we have the same extent because of the way our we you know most of our doing the coastal they don't, thing. Yeah. Yeah. Another thumbs up. How cool is that? Thank you very much. Kim and Janice, wasn't it? Yeah, thanks, Janice. Dark skies, Holly. That's mm. the, uh, the last thing. Is that something bird life is looking at as an issue that ties in with the bird strike? Not at the moment, but that's not to say that we won't. It just depends on what our little capacity is as to what projects yeah. we're picking up at the moment. But, yeah, look, it's an issue that in the Urban Birds team, is on our radar and something we're looking in our sort of conservation action planning is around sort of light pollution impacts and strike impacts as well. There's some great work coming out of Melbourne and their light lab down there and the work they're doing. Fabo. Well, are we locking in next week at midnight, midday? Uh, looks like it. Okay. Then I'll, re <laughs> I'll, I'll reach out to the, to the light team. Is that the Melbourne Uni team or RMIT? Uh, I think it's Uni of Melbourne. Uni Melbourne. Okay. So it might be Kylie's group, is it? I'll, I will chase I will that up. You, you, you can send me the contact and I'll, I'll yes. ask and see if we can maybe get them involved. And you never know, we might get David or 
there we go. Okay, thank you very much for that. David or, or Jared, who I spoke to, or maybe Prow and Cow, mm-hmm. on to talk about migratory birds or even the shorebirds. There's no shortage of it. We could easily, geez, we might have to block two hours for that <laughs> if we get people coming in. Which, is it the shorebirds group mainly in in bird life that would be looking at migratory birds or the swift parrots are migratory, orange-bellied yes. parrots are migratory? I was hoping we could maybe find an excuse to talk about channel built cuckoos or something like that too, because nice. they're migratory. So. Yeah, they absolutely are. Coels so, too. Um, so look, the, yeah, migratory yeah. channel built cuckoos are urban, so it comes yeah. under it's me again. Yeah. It's just my okay. face. So it's yes, the migrat- We have a whole migratory shorebirds program, and we also, of course, work on swifties as well. So that's in the woodland birds team. So there's yeah. That there's a few migratory species that I'd like to so, projects on. Um, yeah, we'll do something. So that's what's coming up next for for me and Holly. We're going to talk. We're going to pre. We're going to preview World Migratory Bird Day. Mm-hmm. There we are, and that happens twice a year. So it's the the second Saturday in May mm-hmm. and in October. I think is the, yes, is the other one be because leaving. that's right. Migratory birds go. And migratory birds come back. So, yes. Yeah. All right, great. Been a while, Holly, but we've had a bit of fun. Yeah. I hope you found it useful, those of you who are with us. And thanks. And thanks if, you, one of, if you're one of the people watching and you filled out the survey. Thanks because Thank it was you. really useful. I will, I'm going to use the information to do some more stuff within bird emergency generally about plant selection and whatnot. And yeah, I put it out there. If you hit me up on Twitter or you email me, grant at thebirdemergency.com, and you want some help with plant selection, hey, I do actually know what I'm talking about. I am a horticulturist, and this has been an interest of mine for a long time. Of course, Holly's the Dr. Bird. So, yeah, between the two of us, we can solve a lot of issues or make some suggestions. Thanks, Holly. Been great. And in 45 minutes' time, we're going to be talking owls and catching them and handling them and health checking them and how to release them. And so that's going to be great. Awesome. See you soon. Thanks, Holly. Thanks, Grant. Bye.